All right, we're going to get started. So I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the real thing. My name is Hope McIntyre. I'm artistic director of Sarah's Body Productions. And we're very excited to be here today. Uh, I'm welcoming our special guest. Um, before we start, I would like to just make sure that we are acknowledging that we are on Treaty One territory here in Winnipeg, where I am zooming in from, and for uh, the University of Winnipeg that is co-hosting this event. Um, it's important for us to recognize that we are on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Inanu, the Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota, and the birthplace of the Métis Nation. I also, on behalf of both the University of Winnipeg and Sarah's Body Productions, want to say that it's not enough to just acknowledge that, but to actually take action and that we are committed to finding a better way forward and to reconciliation and exploring the structures within which we work. Uh, briefly for all of our students joining from uh, University of Winnipeg, just to let you know uh, that we have uh, the TAFSA, which is our Theater and Film Student Association. First meeting will be on September 30th at 12.30 p.m. and they will be doing elections at that time. Excellent. I now have my video back uh, and uh, also want to say that for our students, this is the first in the series of The Real Thing Lectures and for those who aren't aware that is part of the University of Winnipeg's commitment to allow students to learn about what it is like to actually work in the real world and what career options as well as things they need to know for when they graduate from this program. Uh, FemFest, which is hosting this event, uh, is committed to showcasing amazing artists and new ways of working. The festival runs until Saturday with lots of online options as well as some in-person and safely distanced options. Uh, and I think, I've been honored to be able to watch Yolanda's work over the last three days. Her production of Bug has started a lot of meaningful conversations and it's been an example of dismantling colonial structures uh, that exist in theater and it's a gift to have her here with us today. Yolanda Benal is a performer and a playwright of Ojibwe and South Asian descent from Fort William First Nation Indian Reserve in Thunder Bay, Ontario. She's now based in Toronto, uh, graduated from Humber College's theater performance program and was named one of Now Magazine's artists to watch in Summer Works in 2016. She developed Scanner, her first full length play in Factory Theater's Foundry program as currently part of their deep development unit. She has performed in The Breathing Hole and Treasure Island for the Stratford Festival. She's played Teresa in The Craft Walker at Factory Theater and Row in Two Indians back in Summer Works in 2016. And a lot more that I can't possibly encapsulate because I want to give the space and time to Yolanda to talk about her career. So please join me in virtually welcoming Yolanda. <laughs> Miigwech, Hope. Uh, I'm going to talk, I'll, I'll repeat basically everything she just said. Ani bojo Yolanda Nindishnikaz Gijiba Mainga Nindigo Jibimung Makwa Nindo Dam Fort William First Nation in Donjaba Degarondo Ninda. Hello, welcome. Um, my name is Yolanda Benel. Uh, the spirit name that was gifted to me is Gijiba Mayangan, which means circling wolf in Anishinaabe Muin. Um, I am Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, uh, South Asian and European mix from Fort William First Nation near Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is the Superior Robinson Treaty territory. Um, but I've moved around quite a bit and uh, have been fortunate enough to live on different parts of the land and different parts in Thunder Bay as well, um, and have been based here in Tigurando since uh, 2011. I'm a writer, a performer, a creator, a facilitator. I wear many hats. Um, I suppose I could call myself a multidisciplinary artist, but like honestly, these days, who isn't? So I'm, <laughs> I'm still trying to find another name for what it is I do. I think there's just a lot of different things and um, I'm really fortunate enough to be able to do that. I'm two-spirit, I'm queer, bisexual, pansexual, I'm a fighter and I'm a storyteller. Um, 
I introduced myself in the beginning in my traditional language, Anishinaabe Moen, which I was never taught. Uh, my friend Leslie McHugh says that speaking our languages make our ancestors happy. So I try really hard to incorporate my stolen language wherever I can. Um, you know, I've learned from books, from language keepers, from indigenous plays, from some elders, and yes, even from the internet. <laughs> um, I just try and do my best to sprinkle it in wherever I can and keep practicing and learning and incorporating it into my work so we can keep hearing it, you know, so it doesn't die. Um, I'm very grateful to be coming to you from my bedroom, uh, as well as from the traditional lands protected by the Mississaugas and other Anishinaabe nations, the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee, whose Mohawk nations are currently fighting for their land rights at 1492 Land Back Lane in Caledonia, um, which is not far from here. And uh, I encourage you to look into that, as well as looking into the Mi'kmaq fishermen rights right now um, and uh, donate if you can. Um, I always think that uh, land acknowledgements are tricky because often they end up being sort of box ticky or empty. And um, I am grateful to you, Hope, for speaking the way you did about the land acknowledgements because I think I think the way that they've been approached is a good step when it started. But like all relationships with Indigenous people, there needs to be more than just a recording. Um, this land gives so much support and nourishment and we need to do everything in our power to keep trying to protect it and take it back from the imperial state who only seek to destroy it for greed and, and wealth. Um, and so I think that it's, you know, it's more than just saying the names. I want to know how does creating and working on this land affect your story? Um, you know, how are you giving back? It doesn't have to be a part of your show. I think it's beautiful when they're incorporated into the beginning of shows, but it does have to be meaningful. You know, find out the history of the land that you live on or where you come from. Um, blood memory and land memory for me are the same. You know, colonization has forced the removal of land from our bodies. We've sort of forgotten that we are, we're the same, we're connected. The land and body are the same thing. And, and it's really interesting because I think during this pandemic, everyone sort of turned to nature and I think when we remember to do the work and, and try to heal the land, then we in turn can be healed. Um, I wanna say uh, Chimi Gwech, thank you to Sarasvati and the entire team at FemFest for having me today and for having me be a part of this amazing festival. Um, so I've been asked to come in and talk a little bit about my career trajectory and then have a little discussion with you all afterwards, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, so sort of already told you a little bit about and shown you a little bit about myself, but I'll get a little more in depth so you kind of know where I'm coming from. Uh, so like I said, I was born on Fort William First Nation, which is a reservation across the river in Thunder Bay, uh, Ontario. And my great grandmother, Helen Bannon, was also a storyteller. And I have very vivid memories of her telling me stories. Um, I come from a long line of Anishinaabe Kwe. Uh, Kwe is the word uh, for woman or indigenous woman. Um, I'm quite sure I come from a line of uh, what was labeled the pagan Indians by the missionaries who came into our communities and formed what would be the reservation. Um, so it looks like there's always been sort of some kind of resistance in my bloodline, which is always nice to, to find out. Um, my biological father is from India, but he hasn't really existed in my life, which is such a shame because A, I'm awesome, and B, I feel like my sister and I have sort of missed out an entire cultural South Asian experience. So, um, you know, uh, our lives were a little bit different growing up because of that. Um, and I tell you about where I come from because where I come from impacts my career and my lived experiences. Um, and, you know, questions like who's your grandma or who's your cousin or who's your mom is just like kind of a good way to get to know someone, you know? Um, it's something that uh, my friend Kim Sinclair Harvey says too, like when we start days, it's like, who's your grandma? You know, where you come from? Um, so <laughs> I, like uh, many indigenous and other racialized folks, I grew up experiencing and witnessing a lot of violence, uh, racism, abuse, etc., which led to a lot of struggles with mental illness, PTSD, other kind of chronic trauma, including the recognition of intergenerational trauma. But I also grew up knowing that I wanted to do something about the injustices in the world. I grew up dreaming about being a writer and dreaming about being a singer and dream, dreaming about being an actor. I knew absolutely nothing about these industries except for 
what was being shown to me in the media. And I'm 38 years old. And so I grew up in the late 80s and early 90s. So the, the consumption of media was very different at that time. I knew I wanted to tell stories. I just needed to find the right medium that worked for me. But I, I struggled with um, my mental health a lot in my 20s. And I, I was still learning how to cope with childhood trauma and trying to navigate internalized racism and fat phobia. And my creative outlets kept me going many, many times. They kept me alive. And you know, even if they weren't gonna go anywhere, even if it was just like a channel, my writing was the only way I knew how to like focus that energy. So like when we say that art can save lives, this is what we mean. You know, I think about um, the youth in rural communities, like Northern communities who, who don't have the same access as urban communities do in terms of like art and creation. Um, so my reservation is right next to the city, but there were still like, there were no arts programs or creation units or anything like that to help us as youth manage our feelings. Um, I had like a natural pull to writing and creating, but not everybody has that. Um, and, you know, there are lots of ongoing suicide crises with our youth. And I, I, I really feel that providing them with tools for creation could help them channel those feelings as well. Like, I'm always super grateful for this gift. And I really hope to find ways to reach out to different communities. So I think it's a common thing a lot often with um, folks from small communities or small towns um, that don't have the same understanding of what the industry is. And so I'm looking to find ways of like, how do we break down those barriers? Um, so eventually I started doing community theater and really found my passion for performing. You know, I did it in high school too, but um, you know, there was something about doing it within the community. And um, I was in a local burlesque troupe. I <laughs> performed on stage with drag artists and I did all that for about five years before I made the decision to move to Toronto and, and try to make a living from acting. Um, the day jobs were kind of killing my soul, you know, work in retail and in call centers and the food service industry. These are ridiculously hard jobs and um, none of them were good for my mental health. And, you know, I felt like I was always at my best when I was rehearsing or performing. Something about the, the focus of acting sort of quieted down the voices in my head and, and allowed me to sort of just breathe and, and be with those moments. Whereas, um, the other jobs were kind of like would send me spiraling and and you know like if you've worked in any of those positions like they're i they're, i can't they're they're awful but th it's necessary <laughs> so we do them we do what we can um and uh yeah so after a year of saving up on uh in september of 2011 i got on a greyhound bus at like 9 p.m and i said goodbye to my friends i left my sisters and my niece um, behind, which was and still was, is the hardest thing I ever had to do. Um, luckily her and my one sister and my mom live here now. So that's great. Um, and I moved to Toronto, uh, to Grando. I had very little, um, I had no job. I had a room in some guy's apartment who I found on Craigslist. Remember Craigslist, is that even still around anymore? I don't even know that that's terrible. I'm thinking back on that now, I'm like, what, what? Uh, but this room had no windows um, and I had zero idea where to start. I, I, I kind of came in and was like, okay, so now I'm in this big city and it was like a lot of culture shock and I was really sad because I missed everybody and it was just like, what do I do? Um, and also like, <laughs> I didn't know at that point, or, or I don't know if I actually believed at any point that I would, you know, make it as an artist. Um, but I figured I needed to at least say that I tried, you know, um, I needed to give it a shot. <laughs> um, and I think because, especially because statistically, you know, I am not supposed to be here. Um, uh, whether that means living because of the, the attempted genocide or ongoing genocide of indigenous people or um, because of the mental health issues or whatever, all these statistics that have me in this sort of like whole, um, we, we I think as, as racialized folks, um, we have to remember that those are just, those are numbers and it's, we're so much more than that. And we can find ways to sort of break down those barriers, just keep like finding those ways. Um, so yeah, like I said, I knew nothing about the industry. 
Uh, and so the first few months um, we're auditioning again for a community theater, but community theater in Toronto now. Um, and I finally found a job, which is great. And, um, and luckily I had a group of friends who moved on at the same time as me. And so a few of them were taking music at Humber. And so then I don't, I can't quite remember how it came in, but the idea of um, going to theater school sort of dropped into my head. I figured that the best way to sort of hone in and work on my craft and to better understand the theater industry was to go to school. So I applied to three, I got into one, um, but it was the best one I could have gotten into, honestly. Um, Humber has a really strong focus on devised physical theater and creation. And I was all about that. Um, even in the audition, we had to create a, a movement score and I got really excited about the possibility of going there. The, the audition was an entire day of like voice and movement assessments and exercises and creation. And then of course a monologue. And I hadn't ever really done that kind of work before. Like I remember going and thinking like, okay, you're the oldest person here. <laughs> you're a big girl and you're probably a little out of shape, but that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Just stay strong. You can do it. Um, you know, and I looked around the room and there were like all these like 18 year olds. And I was like, ah. <laughs> like okay. but I, I kept up. I held my own. I impressed myself. I pushed just as hard as they did. Um, and the whole audition was kind of like, um, you know that episode of Fresh Prince where Aunt Viv joins the dance class and then she like comes like she comes in and like owns the room and and then afterwards she just like collapses on the ground like that that was 100% what happened with me I left I was like yeah I did the audition and then I left and was like oh my god I can't walk it was it was ridiculous um so the thing is I um I dropped out of high school in grade 11 uh I was really stressed out at home because of violence and I was skipping a lot and my girlfriend at the time was also dropping out so I ended up doing some correspondence and like homeschooling at the adult learning center but I didn't ever graduate so I had to do some upgrading before I could get in but I was accepted and at 30 years old I attended theater school um, which was interesting <laughs> my experience in theater school was it it was difficult um, and beautiful and something I would never trade for the world, but I also would never want to go through that again. Um, like it was probably the best decision I could have made for my career and my life, but I, it can stay back there where, where, where it happened. Um, I learned so many things. I learned that my trauma was still in pockets of my body. Uh, when I broke myself down and exposed to those pockets, a lot of it came flooding to the surface. I learned how to ground myself and breathe. I learned technique. I learned that I was hiding indigenous parts of myself, that my politics became silent at some point. I learned that I longed for love more than anything. I learned how to work with a broken heart. Um, I, and this is really important. I learned what my fat body was capable of. I surprised myself. Physical theater terrified me. Um, but I've always loved moving and dancing. Like I choreographed the dances for the burlesque troupe I was in and some of the musicals that we did back home. Movement was just, it's just a part of my vocabulary, but I had allowed the world to make me believe that I was limited in my strength. And so when it came time to do a shoulder stand, I just immediately was like, I can't do that. There's, there's no way I can do that. How in the world, how in the world am I supposed to get this body up in the air and hold it up with just my sh shoulder no 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 um and so our instructor tells us that we each have to do it and show him how we do it and the goal is to stay up long enough to sing sing a song while we're up there <laughs> that we had to bring in so i'm like panicking with my partner um who is super strong um but also isn't able to do it very well so i was like well how how am i but I tried because I have to try and because I have to. So, you know, I, I get into the position and my partner's using their body to hold me up and, and then they move. And then I'm like up in the air. I'm like my whole body, my legs, my, they're up in the air. I'm vertical and I can hold it. And when it came time to go around the circle, I'm like one of maybe like six or seven people who can hold that position and finish their song. So <laughs> 
from that moment on, I stopped telling myself what I couldn't do, um, especially when I couldn't do something physical. I just, I kept surprising myself with what I was able to do. So I think just remember that don't allow other people telling you what your body can and can't do because you're the only person who knows that. And so I fell in love with physical theater. I fell in love with movement scores. I learned so many different ways of telling stories. And I learned the ones that really spoke to me. I learned how to love language, even this colonial tongue. I learned how much I love breaking apart sounds and sonnets. I'm a little bit of a voice nerd and I really love the IPA. Um, I learned that I could in fact play a lead. I didn't always have to be ethereal or a side character or background that I fully have the capabilities and, and ability to be a lead character. Um, and these are the beautiful things I learned. Um, these and so many more things. I also made friends with some of the most important people in my life now. You know, you experience a battle with these people and it's hard not to make at least some lifelong connections. And not everything was great, as I'm sure some of you know. I, I learned that there are instructors out there who are focused on aesthetic and beauty and oftentimes BIPOC artists don't fall into that category for them. I learned about the systemic sexism and racism. I learned that faculty members could get away with assault and abuse and subsequently so could other students. I learned that trauma could be exploited. I learned that there are unsafe ways of working that I didn't know that I wanted to be a part of. I learned that I evidently regress in age when I'm around 20 somethings and just act completely irrational sometimes. Um, but I think most importantly, I, I found my artistic voice and I found how I wanted to create. I feel like I kept my writing abilities hidden for some reason. You know, we didn't really start writing anything until third year and that's just kind of when I, I let it loose. Um, we had to do our third year mask, our creation projects, which were 15 minute solo pieces. And so that's when I started writing Bug. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really, I really, I knew that I wanted to talk about addictions and I think instinctively I wanted to talk about intergenerational trauma, but I didn't have the language for that yet as I hadn't really begun my reclamation journey. Um, I, I knew the things that I wanted to write about and the things that, and how I wanted to like physicalize it. Um, you know, I've been writing poetry since I was seven years old and it was, I think my first language. Um, and so I thought it was time to use it. Um, so I was excited about this blend of storytelling methods and this dramatic story that I was telling. So I graduated in 2015 um, and, you know, I was sort of worried that because of my age and ignorance of the industry and experience that I wouldn't succeed. I was a little, I was kind of scared about that, but when really um, my life experience and my age is what helped me to do well in school. And I think making this decision later in life was probably one of the best things I could have done. Um, lived a little bit of life before being torn down to nothing, you know, and then built back up because, because I was older, I already had a, a pretty solid foundation, you know, riddled with cracks and dents and bruises and tender places, but I had an experienced core. Um, so I ended up su submitting a uh, bug for the Wasaika Check Begins to Dance Festival at Native Earth. Um, I, uh, it was really, I also ended up getting a job there as an administrative assistant, which was pretty amazing because not only did I have access to an entire script catalog of indigenous works, but I also met so many incredible artists that came through and I got to jury grants and eventually the festival itself. Um, you learn so much for working for a theater company as an artist, even if you're learning things you don't want in your career or the, or the kind of, you learn sort of even the, how the kind of artist you don't want to be. It's all still really important learning. Um, so I got into the festival, which was exciting. And it was there, I got paired up with Cole Alvis as my dramaturg. Um, and I remember how nervous I was that first day together because I was about to show them this piece that I hadn't shown anybody since performing it in school. And um, immediately Cole recognized that the piece had two scripts that um, there was what was written on the page and then what my body was doing in space. And we just kind of like took off from there. Um, I think that finding people to work with that match your values and energy is really important. Someone that knows how to encourage you to push it as far as you can go, if only to prove to yourself that you're capable. It's, it's sort of interesting to look back at those early days of development because Cole and I instinctively began working 
in a decolonial way without discussing it yet, without any sort of understanding of what we were actually doing together. But we began the seeds of what would become Manadunes Collective. We took our time, we got to know each other. We talked a lot. We began each day by checking in with each other. And it was like, this was when it re I really began to see that there were other ways that theater could work. Um, the festival went really well. Um, and I should also mention that this was the beginning of my reclamation journey. And what I mean by that is I began to unpack my internalized racism and shame. Um, things are different in Toronto than in Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay has the highest number of hate crimes and murders of Indigenous people, specifically youth. Um, I grew up understanding that assimilation was the only way I was going to get ahead. I never denied being Indigenous, but I didn't know how or, or understand any aspects of my own culture. And it took me a really long time for me to accept that that wasn't my fault. So I began seeing healers and traditional support workers. I read scripts. I spoke to other Indigenous artists. I read books. I spoke to my family, which was really important because they, I could see it happening for them too. Um, I returned to the land and land-based work was happening. I learned my own history. I learned more about the collective Indigenous history on Turtle Island. I learned that North America is called Turtle Island. Um, I learned how to smudge. I did a lot of deep work. Um, and, and still somehow felt like I was a fraud for a while because, you know, I should have known how to do these things, but, um, that's not what colonization had in mind, you know? Um, so, you know, I'm doing all this work and I'm celebrating the fact that I just like wrote and performed a piece on the festival stage. And then two things happened simultaneously that sort of solidified my, my career as an actor and a creator. So I first submitted Bug for the Rhubarb Festival at Buddies in Bad Times, uh, which is a queer theater here, which I was already volunteering at, which is also a good way to see shows for free. If you volunteer as ushers for theaters, you can see all kinds of theater for free. And free theater is like, I mean, I don't know when we're going to be doing that next, <laughs> after this, but um, whenever it comes back or if the way in which it comes back, I, uh, if that's still a possibility, that was the best way I found to, to see free theater. Um, and so we, uh, we did it at the Rhubarb Festival um, that winter, which was awesome. Um, and that, uh, er, that fall I auditioned for The Crack Walker by Judith Thompson, which was being directed by her at Factory Theater. Now, okay, so Judith's daughter was in Humber with me. She was a year below and she thought I'd be perfect for the part of Teresa. So she's the one who convinced me to audition and like whispered a bit in her mom's ear about me. But you know, they, they tell you to be careful about general auditions because you know, they'll only see you once to th every three years. So the schools were like, be careful about general auditions. Don't, do, don't do general auditions in your first year out of school. Um, I don't know. I think that whole thing is absolutely shit. If you ask me. <laughs> Like, why wouldn't you want to see as many people as possible? You know, I don't know. Anyways, um, there was no guarantee that I was going to get the part, but um, especially just graduating school, I was like, I don't know. But I threw myself into that audition and I ended up getting the part. And so just after Rhubarb ended, I began rehearsals for Crack Walker. And I, um, I remember being told that I was the first Indigenous woman to play the part of Teresa who is an indigenous character, um, which was just baffling. I, I remember doing a lot of interviews and talking about indigenous women. And I remember falling in love with Teresa. And I think I'm just, I think I just realized like when I was writing this, that it was really her that made me pay attention and really gave me that strong voice to uphold indigenous women. There was a talk back after one performance and this Anishinaabe woman stood up who was also from Thunder Bay. And she told me that she has a 15 year old daughter with fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and she saw her in my performance and she had never seen her daughter represented on stage before. So it was incredibly moving and, and really drove home the importance of representation for me, um, especially in a country who doesn't see you as anything more than a statistic. Um, and so I, you know, I, I watched as it um, as women, indigenous women were ignored in this industry. Um, and I saw incredible art by indigenous women get shot down by insecure men who found us threatening. Um, so it became incredibly important for me to tell my stories for and 
about Indigenous women. And that's sort of been my focus. Um, so then I began to write Scanner, um, which uh, I applied for a micro grant called the Recommender Grant. So um, here in Ontario, the RGTC grants are micro grants that you can apply to uh, different theater companies with. Each company has an allotted amount of funds to dole out and you can apply with a, a project or an idea and get and get like a couple of thousand dollars if you know if they if you're chosen. Um, it's in it's super helpful uh, when you're looking for um, writing or development time just to like sit there and be able to like focus on your script. Um, so I, um, I began to write this play and um, Again, it's a, it was a, it had a strong focus on Indigenous women, and um, and it was actually and then it got picked up by Factory Theater, and I was invited to be a part of their creators unit to continue to develop it, um, which turned into deep development, and eventually I became the playwright in residence, and now it's being um, getting uh, workshopped towards uh, production. Um, I was also told not to write plays with more than like four characters because it'll never get produced. Scanner has like eight, <laughs> seven of which are indigenous women. I was like, tell me I can't write more than four characters, you know, writing all them. Um, and like Scanner has had so many workshops and readings with so many different uh, people. It's just been like, it's done a bunch of different things and it's really great to like be able to hear it. Um, I remember reading um, Unnatural and Accidental Women by Marie Clements uh, while I was in school. And so the idea of like a large group of Indigenous women on stage was really exciting to me and something I know we rarely see. It, so that was also the first play I read, I think, where I was like, oh, I could play this part or even this part. I could even play this part. And like, that's super rare, too. But I was really drawn to Valerie because um, I don't know if anyone's read the play, but if you haven't, I recommend it. Uh, Valerie was great because she was described as like being a big woman and like full of life and she was super funny and I was just like that's like that's the role I want um, so like unnatural really inspired Scanner but more so Scanner was about the experiences growing up on my res and the disconnection between the worlds of adults and children um, and like I said uh, it had been workshopped a lot I think that I think that work can be over dramaturged and and over workshopped for sure um, I think that's kind of what happened with Scanner a little bit. You know, there wasn't room for it yet, so we just kept working and working it. Um, I had to leave it alone for a bit because, well, because I had other work, but also because I, I needed to give it space. Um, I'm coming back at the end of it, uh, back to the end of it, back to it at the end of this year with some new ideas. And, um, but I, I think it's important to recognize, like, as creators, that sometimes you're going to want to, like, throw your work in the garbage. Um, <laughs> uh, don't do that. Um, just put it away for a little bit, you know, put it to bed, give it a little nest or put it in a drawer and um, and come back to it later. Um, sometimes you just need a little bit of a break. It's like being in a relationship, right? You just, you just need to step away a little bit. Um, yeah, I think it's, I do think those workshops are important. It's important to hear the words. It's helpful when actors can read it um, and to have discussions about themes. Sometimes it's not just about reading the play, um, often it can be about discussing the worlds of the play or the world of the play, depending on what you're writing, um, characters, their voices, um, asking lots of questions, talking about the different themes that you're going through, um, exploring movement. Even if your piece doesn't have movement, it's really important to explore movement in the body because you're using your body to tell the story, right? And regardless of if you're moving, moving through space or not. Um, so I think it's like, it's important to assert the way you want to work with people and who you want to work with and just make sure that everyone's getting paid fairly, including yourself. Um, so I, in my trajectory, I had Bug had just wrapped up at Rhubarb. I just finished Crackwalker and I was writing Scanner. And then I was asked to audition for the Birmingham Conser Conservatory at Stratford. Um, I thought when I got that email that it, it was a mistake. <laughs> I was like, did they send this to the right person? Um, and I, I also like knew or like felt that I wasn't like a Stratford actor. So I, I also knew that the conservatory was like a two year program. And I was like, I'm 34 years old. I don't want to go back to school again. Like I just graduated. I can't do that again. Um, but I, I did the audition because I 
wanted them to see me and, and you know, networking, networking, networking. Um, so I piled into a shuttle van with a group of other indigenous and POC actors, which was suspicious. Um, and off we went to audition for one of the biggest theater festivals in Canada. Um, and because the stakes were so low for me, I wasn't as nervous as everyone else was, um, or as much as I normally get, like I was still nervous. I did my warm up in the morning. So I just sort of sat there and like ate desserts. Well, everyone else was on yoga mats stretching and being absolutely terrified i mean eventually i grabbed a yoga mat and like started stretching because i didn't look want to look like an asshole but um <laughs> i mean there were people there that were saying that this audition was like it for them that their whole career rested on it and i i i think that that's um unsafe and uh you know don't put all your like i think that putting so much focus on like one gig or like one job is um is not healthy um, like why, when there are so many stories to tell, would you limit yourself in that way? Um, and I think the thing is too, like when auditioning, like when you remind yourself that there are, are other options um, or you can kind of trick your brain into believing that you maybe don't actually care about this audition, oftentimes those nerves can go away at least, or at least it's like aren't as strong. And you can just allow it to be an opportunity for you to show them what you can do. You know, like this is the thing you do, this is your job. I feel like, and this is not this is, this is not as black and white as I'm going to say it, but I feel like if you don't believe that you're good at your job, then how can you expect others to believe it or for people to like pay you for it, right? Somebody told me that somewhere, and I, and at some point, and I eventually it took a while, but it helped me to actually be able to say to myself, "Yes, I am a good actor," um, and that can be hard for some of us to say. And I think the more that we um, you know, believe it or understand that, like, this is the thing that we're good at. You know, if you're working at like a restaurant, like, if you're bad at that job, you're going to get fired, that sort of thing. So like, thinking about it in that sort of way. I mean, it's tricky with arts practices and creation, because it doesn't work. It's again, it's not so black and white, right. So um, but I think just like, having that belief in yourself is really important. Um, so I did the audition, I auditioned well, I went shopping and then I came back home. Um, and that summer Bug was accepted into summer works as a part of the workshop series. I was also in another summer work show called Two Indians by Phelan Johnson at the same time. And so this is a lesson on limitations because what happened was during the performance of Bug, I ended up pulling my calf muscle with about five minutes left to the show, including a whole last dance. I mean, I did it. I limped my way through that bitch and apparently no one was the wiser. Um, but I also had a show of two Indians that night and I think like two more performances left and we smoke danced in that show, which is like, that's a lot of foot and leg work for anyone who knows what smoke dance is. Um, and that had to sort of be like recalibrated for my injury. So I was performing in one show, developing and performing in another, writing a different play. And I was also co-organizing a spoken word event for black and indigenous solidarity. So limitations, my body wasn't about that life and decided that the tension was too much and showed up. And so don't take any more than your body can handle. Otherwise it can cause more damage. Um, it's just a, a matter of safety and, and making sure that you keep yourself safe. Um, so I didn't get into the conservatory, but they did want me for two parts at Stratford. And um, I know at the, the time, despite the feelings I had about the festival, I was really overwhelmed. The Breathing Hole was commissioned for Canada 150. It was written by Colleen Murphy, who is not an Indigenous woman. Um, but the play was going to be directed by Renalda Arluk, who is Inuit and First Nations, and um, who is now a dear friend of mine. Um, it was a big old deal because there had never been this many Indigenous people at the festival, but one time it was another first. Um, and I also got cast as a pirate and a shotgun wielding innkeeper in Treasure Island, which is probably one of the coolest parts I love from play. <laughs> um, so I quit my day job, which was terrifying. Um, and I moved to Stratford for nine months to work at the festival. Um, and uh, I brought my politics there. I asked for a healer to be present and a talking circle. I asked that they incorporate land acknowledgements, especially if I had to sit through O Canada. Um, and all of us had to sit through all Canada and deal with Canada Day in a small town. Um, and they did all these things, but there was just so much extra labor of just being Indigenous in that institution. Um, we had to call out insensitivity on a calendar screen when the text alluded to uh, all the thousands of missing socks. Um, 
I had to see the word savages written across the Native Canadian Art Gallery and reported as a hate crime. So there was, a, it was a lot to deal with. Um, as BIPOC artists, we can't always control the behavior of the institutions that we're in. Um, I will say this though, we have more power than they let us think we do. Um, they want us to be grateful to be in their spaces and we can be for sure. But that doesn't mean that we get to be treated as objects or be disrespected or forced to fade into the background because they are checking their boxes. It does not mean that we have to put up with racialized violence or acts of microaggressions. We can reject it and we can use our own voices, especially now, or at least I hope, especially now while we're having these conversations. And I know that it's scary and I know that it's intimidating. Um, and I know that it's really, really difficult. Um, the more you learn about uh, the right that you have to be in that space, uh, the more you learn how to use your voice in those spaces so that you can say, no, I'm actually um, not going to do that or, you know, because they, they need us. Um, so Strava was over and I was very sad to be leaving, uh, mostly because the apartment they gave me was absolute perfection. I will never find an apartment like that for the price in Toronto. Um, so leaving was really hard, but I started rehearsals for another play that was in the day after I got back. Um, meanwhile, back at the ant farm, we had received a grant that I had written for the development of Bug, which grant writing skills get into that gig, baby. Learn everything you can know about grant writing skills because it is a very useful skill to have. My biggest piece of grant writing advice is to not be afraid to write your narrative with passion. I mean, be clear, be intentional, know what it is that you wanna say, but allow your, your passion and your voice to come through. Also have a great budget in place. That's also very helpful. <laughs> um, but practice, even practice writing grants or like work with somebody who writes grants. It's really, it's really great. Um, so that whole thing was the beginning of Manitoulin's Collective and how we started. So there were a lot of important people that attended the Summer Works Pulled Calf Muscle Show uh, who wanted to program it or develop it. Um, Josephine Ridge and Naomi Campbell from Luminato Festival were very keen to have Bug in the lineup. So this meant, this meant that we had to amass an entire team. So we found our designers and our musicians and, um, and we um, really began to develop uh, in the new year. And so we were um, accepted into festivals in the Coast Salish territory before the Luminata premiere, which was like really a way of developing and shaping the show. Um, I had also already begun writing another play <laughs> as a part of the Animki Creators Unit uh, called White Girls and Moccasins, um, which is now in residency at, with Buddies and will also be going towards production. Um, and so, like, <sighs> I know that I'm making it sound easy, like write play, get into creators unit, submit to festival, get into festival, have theater company want to continue to develop and eventually produce. I mean, that's, that is what happens and, and that is what happened to me, but that's not always the way it happens. Many artists get overlooked or ignored in favor of others. Um, I mean, we are seeing a rise in spaces for BIPOC artists and creators who, which is, which is great. Um, and so hopefully things are shifting so that we can begin to be given more platforms to tell our stories and in a different way too. Um, and not so uh, much in a rigid institutional kind of way. Um, so from this point on my career as a writer and a performer were sort of taking off in tandem, but um, it meant a lot of hard work. Um, anytime that I was performing in a show, I was also writing a grant for one of my own pieces. So if to be, I think to be able to sustain us, sustain yourself as an artist, um, you, you have to kind of be doing more than one thing at the same time. But I also want to stress that um, burnout is real and, and do whatever you can to keep yourself safe. Don't like, we've learned that, we've learned that this doesn't work. And so whatever you need to do to center yourself, you don't have to like work as hard as I did. Hard work is important and putting the work in is important but also keeping yourself safe and, and safe from injury because I didn't keep myself safe from injury. And I injured myself a bunch of times because I wasn't um, listening to the rest that my body needed. Um, 
So like, I've never uh, just had one job since I began my theater career. And I just kept piling more on because I, I wanted to learn more. I want to find out what I like and what doesn't work for me. And that's important too, you know, like trying different things like, oh, maybe I'll try directing. Does that not work? Or like, um, yeah, so I, you know, it became um, something that I was really invested in. And, um, and so Cole and I really worked on reflecting what Manajun's Collective really is. Um, we described ourselves as a circle of artists creating Indigenous performance. We try to create safe and supportive spaces for ourselves and for our team. We try to work in a deeply Indigenous and decolonial way that align with our value system, which shows itself in many ways, whether it's shorter rehearsal days, daily check-ins, no two-show days, or refusing to have white critics review our work. Um, I, uh, I've gotten a chance to do many different things and travel um, and be part of writing residencies. Um, I got to play Valerie in Unnatural and Accidents of Women at the NAC, which was another first. I experienced, was, I experienced what co-writing a play was like. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I experienced what uh, working with the land is like and, and really developing my land-based creation, which is a huge part of my practice now. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I've, I've experienced being the first one so many times in my career and, and some of it's just like kind of ridiculous at the time. And I want to acknowledge that there are um, Indigenous women that have done all this work before me. And um, it's not to discount the work that I'm doing, but that they have done a lot to so that I could be here doing what I what I do now. Um, I think that storytelling doesn't have to belong to capitalism. I think we can take it back and make it work for us, have it work better. I don't think any of us know exactly what that looks like, but we're trying things and we're working from our values. And all I know is that a system that doesn't work for everyone is a system that doesn't work. Um, and I know that pushing back against these systems does and can come with consequences. Um, when we made the decision to have only BIPOC writers review the show in February, I was met with all kinds of violence. Um, but, you know, I, I think that these are the decisions and the sacrifices we make to ensure that the artists that are coming up behind us can tell their stories in a way that's safe and sustainable and accessible. So I don't have all the answers or maybe in even any of the answers. I, I work and make decisions from my heart. It's the only thing I know how to do. Leanne Simpson talks about Odebuewen. Um, in my language, Dibwewen means truth and Ode means the heart. So when you combine them, it means the truth of the heart or the sound that the heart makes, which is truth. And I feel like as long as I'm working from that truthful place, um, it won't steer me wrong, or at least I hope it won't. It hasn't so far. Um, so that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yolanda. That's amazing. And so much, just so much wonderful information and and perspective and I feel like an incredible gift that you've offered to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, some of our students from the University of Winnipeg probably have to disperse back to some classes. But, oh, I'm so um, sorry. <laughs> no, no, do not, do not apologize because that was just so important for everyone to hear. But um, I will invite anyone who is able to continue to stay a little bit longer to, to do so, so we can address at least a couple questions in the time that we have with Yolanda, which is yeah. so valuable. Um, so yeah, you can feel free if you do have a, a question that you can put it in the Zoom chat. If you're in the Zoom room with us, if you're on YouTube, you can use that chat form and our staff are monitoring that. Um, so yeah, just want to invite anyone. And if you're in the Zoom room, you can also choose to, to speak if you feel comfortable doing that instead of putting it in the chat. So um, we will give folks a moment to, to uh, present any questions that they might have and allow Yolanda to breathe in. <laughs> have a big jug of water. Uh, and I guess maybe just to get us started is uh, in listening to you, I mean, there's just so much that I was certainly processing, but what stood out uh, was a lot about, about values and what that means to us. And, and yeah, we were working in, you know, the university with companies, we're working in such structures that can make it hard to, to do that. Yeah. Would you have any advice for for those who are starting their careers and are coming up against some of those barriers? Yeah, I think, like I said, um, I think to just remember to not be afraid to like ask for what you need. 
um, or ask for what you want in your spaces because I think that in the, the industry and often institutions sort of have this like, you know, there's this hierarchical kind of um, attitude. It's like, well, we are giving you a job, so you should be grateful to be here. Um, and and sure, yeah, I'm grateful. <laughs> That's great. Um, but also like, this is a relationship, right? Like I'm bringing my work and, or like I'm bringing myself, my uh, my ability and my, my acting and you're providing this this part of it. So there's, there's, these it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship and it should work that way and so i think that we're in a time now where we can have those conversations so i definitely think that um really uh really just asserting yourself and and laying and just saying these are the things that i want um and request the things that you want in those spaces and in those rooms so that you need to keep yourself safe and it benefits both of you like it's not just you know it benefits the work in general Excellent. Uh, we've got several questions coming up now. Yes. So, do you have any advice for a young Indigenous actor who is just starting their journey? Yes, <laughs> so much. Um, I would say meet up and get to know as many other Indigenous actors as you can. Um, we have a, a brilliant community. Um, uh, not everybody works with each other and that's fine. Um, it's like many communities, there's complications and, um, but there are so many incredible artists. I would, I would highly recommend like just messaging somebody or, um, be like, Hey, like, can we have a chat or like sit down and like have a, and have a talk. You learn different ways of, um, Di like other everyone else's different journey uh, read as many indigenous plays as you can by um, all different playwrights that's a really uh, really good thing to know and to have and also like um, reading indigenous values books like Leanne Simpson's Dancing on a Turtle's Back um, kind of understanding the history of where we like the history of indigenous people in Canada um, is it's important it's important because it informs the work and it informs you and your body on stage um, which is an inherently political body so um, but I I'm excited for you and uh, I'm so grateful that you're adding your voice to our chorus I'm happy that you're out there Thank you. Uh, another question. How did you keep yourself moving forward when you were faced with violence regarding your work? It was tough. Uh, I had never in my life, like I, like I have been bullied. I was bullied growing up, but like, this was a whole other level. This was like death threats and like, um, and uh, it was tough, but I, I think the, I, I had to also focus on the amounts of love that were coming in as well, because equal, parts of my community and my peers and my family and my loved ones were just like sending me so much love. Um, and also that I got to, because I was performing the show every night and the girl in the show goes through this healing journey, I subsequently got to heal through performing that show. And so every night I, I went through trauma and then healing. So I think it just sort of like melted together in that way. So that worked out nicely. <laughs> Uh, next question, how do you find being a queer creator as well as a BIPOC creator has impacted your experience coming from another queer creator? Awesome. Um, I mean, it, it, it provides um, a level of understanding and views on life that um, not everybody has. Um, and so whether that be uh, like difficult things that I've dealt with in terms of um, being brown skinned or, or being queer, being bisexual in particular, um, or the beautiful things about those, about those things and the beautiful ways that we get treated. Um, I think that both of those experiences are, are play into how I create um, it. it it allows me to tell more interesting stories, I think. Um, and also because I can do that, it allows for other people, like other queer BIPOC artists or even just witnesses to be able to sort of see themselves in that work. Um, 
representation is really important to me and um if, only because as a young person like if i saw somebody something that i could be or i could attain to be then that it, it drops in that belief system and makes you believe harder that that could happen to you whereas when you don't see yourself it's harder to to find that so i think that that is one of the biggest things for me um in terms of being both queer and uh um indigenous and brown Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just share the, the comment that we've got from someone who uh, is doing some volunteer work at Nadinawe, and Nadinawe is a, a program here in, in Winnipeg that does amazing work. And she was asking about having your presentation available. So we've just let let her know. We'll let everyone know that yeah, we've got this up on our YouTube channel, um, and we'll leave it there for students to be able to to watch um, moving forward as well, so that that it can be shared. I think it's a huge gift. Um, and I think we'll just we'll just wrap up. I don't know if you have any kind of closing uh, remarks you'll end in terms of like any any advice or final thoughts. I know so many of, of the students and I know in our community here in Winnipeg, we're really struggling with how to how to move forward in a good way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think anything that you might want to discuss <laughs> with would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, again, I think that it comes down to working from your heart um and 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 trusting uh trusting yourself and and surrounding yourself with good people um and people that you trust and people that you want to work with um and it's not to limit yourself to say that only work with those people but it's a good like foundation to have like a community that you can always kind of return to um because it's a being an artist is a lonely profession and um the more that you can like put into your community and 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 reach out reach out reach out um it's it's important to have those conversations with your community and reach out to people um so that you don't feel that so that you can, you can feel less alone um, it's a hard, it's hard work, this industry, and, and we can each all just keep trying to change it so that it does actually work for everyone, um, because it doesn't work for everyone right now. And so now we have this opportunity to build it back up and build it the way you, we want. So I would encourage you to think about how do you want to tell your, how do you want to tell stories? How do you want to change the ecology of what theater is and has been this whole time? How do we, yeah, like how do you, how do you want to add your voice to that? Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yolanda. There's lots of thanks coming in on our, <laughs> our messages on Zoom sure on YouTube as well. So we'll keep those open for a few moments if folks have other things they want to share. But I am just so deeply grateful to you for, for today and for the past three days at FemFest. It has been an incredible uh, gift to all of us. Um, so miigwech and I hope you get some rest now. <laughs> <laughs> miigwech. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been really great working with everybody and getting to know everybody a little bit. And um, and being able to sort of like chat with people. So that's great. Thank you so much. Miigwech. Chi miigwech. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, and we will, we will be posting this and keeping it up if you want to come back to it. Thank you.